Okay. Do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, are we waiting for Sam? No. Yeah, well, I, I guess he's going to come in at some point. I, I'll, I'll try to ping him on the, the Slack. Okay. And see what he's around. Yeah, you can go ahead, ahead and get started. Uh, yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so today, uh, the three of us will be presenting on uh, Discourse and Dialogue. Uh, firstly, I'll be going through a brief introduction of uh, this course, and more specifically, uh, I'll be focusing on co-reference resolution. So uh, this course is basically sort of a grouping of sentences. So a monologue can sort of be a discourse, and also dialogue is uh, a discourse. And one of the issues uh, that arises in this course is, uh, of course, that of co-reference resolution. This uh, arises from uh, the phenomena of uh, anaphora, uh, which means uh, basically that uh, expressions that correlate with some entities uh, in a text. Uh, so to look at this uh, in detail, uh, let's just move on to this example over here, where we have uh, this sentence, uh, these two sentences. And uh, what we're interested in is the expressions in a sentence that uh, refer to entities. So in this case, there'll be uh, these reference, uh, John, Bill's car dealership, uh, Toyota Camry, he and it. And then uh, we'll see that uh, John is actually an antecedent of he because he is referring to John. And Toyota Camry is an antecedent of it because um, uh, it is referring to Toyota Camry. So essentially, in co-reference resolution, what we want to do is to cluster these uh, uh, expressions that uh, refer to the same mention together. So in this case, uh, John and he are a reference one. And then uh, Toyota Camry and it is another cluster uh, reference two. And then those car dealership is alone by itself. Uh, so to kind of uh, uh, go ahead and, and solve this problem, there are mainly uh, two kinds of approaches to co-reference resolution. Uh, firstly, is mention pairing, uh, which is basically sort of a binary classification of whether uh, mentions or uh, reference are co-referent. And then uh, there's mention ranking, which is basically a ranking uh, between the links uh, of, uh, of the links between mentions, and then we'll take the highest link, uh, ranked link in the mention. So uh, moving on to uh, mention pairing, uh, the general outline of uh, mention pairs is uh, basically you have uh, first mention detection. So in this sentence, uh, the mention detection uh, processing set would uh, detect that I, neither, he, my, and she are mentions in, in the sentence. And then uh, <clears throat> because we want to find uh, the antecedents to she, uh, so we would kind of have to look at every single mention that came before she. And then calculate kind of a co-referent probability, uh, the probability that uh, mention I and mention J uh, is uh, co-referent uh, for every single mention pair. And then uh, if they are above a certain threshold, then uh, essentially we'll uh, link them together and say that they are uh, co-referent and that uh, the previous mention is an antecedent of, of the current uh, mention. And then ultimately, uh, we would uh, sort of impose a transitive closure on all the linked mentions so that we can uh, cluster them into different clusters. Uh, and that's the ultimate goal. Uh, but one of the issues that arises from mention pairs, uh, it's pretty obvious, is that uh, one wrong mention pair actually causes entire clusters to be wrong. Uh, so for example, if I have two clusters referring to two different entities, and there's any one link between uh, any of the mentions between these two clusters, then essentially these two clusters will be linked to one cluster. And the entire cluster will sort of be wrong. And this is uh, especially glaring since uh, we are using kind of a threshold-based system to determine whether two pairs uh, constitute a mentioned pair. Uh, so an example being that uh, if I have the sentence, I found a banana uh, and sat on a blue chair and peeled it, uh, usually we would know that uh, when I'm, the it refers to the banana that I'm peeling. But if, let's say, the model is kind of uh, fairly confident that it also refers to blue chair. It's highly confident that uh, it refers to banana. Essentially, banana and uh, blue chair would both be kind of uh, clustered in the same cluster, and that, that would result in the wrong clustering. So uh, with this in, in view, uh, people have come up with uh, like mention ranking. So instead of saying, uh, I want to find all the possible co-referent mentions, uh, uh, I would try to only find only one of the highest uh, probability in terms of um, mention I, mention J, and just link them together. And then ultimately, uh, you would also get uh, the same kind of clustering that uh, we would get uh, with mentioned pairs. But uh, in this case, there would be a much lower probability in terms of making uh, clustering mistakes. Uh, also over here, I think there's a not applicable mention here. Uh, this usually means uh, it's basically a dummy mention. 
So for example, uh, I'm looking at NADA and I'm looking at I and uh, the dummy mentioned, and then uh, the probability score between uh, I and J for NADA and I is uh, extremely low. So I would know that uh, I cannot, uh, NADA cannot be possibly referring to I and instead just allocating a dummy mention. So this is for words that don't have any antecedents uh, in the text. And then, so the procedure for mention pairs and mention ranking are rather similar. So they're both, the outline itself uh, basically says, oh, let me find the mentions in a sentence and then <clears throat> find the probabilities between all the pairings that are possible between my current mention and the mentions that came before it. Uh, but the main difference is basically they are training objective. So for mention pairs, it will be trained uh, to minimize for the loss over all the different pairs. And then for mention ranking, we'll just try to minimize the loss for the highest ranked pair. Right, so um, with these two approaches, we still kind of have to look at uh, how exactly we go about calculating the probability between uh, mention I and mention J. And this is where uh, sort of different models uh, come into play. Uh, so in traditional approaches in non-neural models, uh, there's a lot of feature engineering involved. So uh, for example, there are uh, <clears throat> features such as like agreement of pronoun. So uh, given a sentence, uh, I voted for Nader because he was most assigned alive with my values, she said, uh, like if we were to look at the mention she and the mention he, then there's definitely no agreement of pronoun here because there's a, a gender uh, disagreement. So this uh, kind of sets hard constraint on what can be a mention, uh, what can be an antecedent of a mention. And then uh, we also have synthetic constraints. So for example, uh, Bob bought him a drink versus Bob, Bob bought himself a drink. So in the first instance, we know that him cannot uh, logically be referring to Bob. But in the second instance, uh, Bob bought himself a drink, then himself uh, can uh, essentially be referring to Bob. So uh, other than these kind of hard constraints, we also have uh, handcrafted weights for sort of additional features. So one of them is sentence recency. This is uh, quite obvious. So even uh, if a mention uh, comes in the same sentence as the one that we are currently looking at, then uh, there's a higher probability of it being uh, being linked to that mention, uh, being the antecedent of that mention. And then uh, there's also things like subject emphasis. So if in the previous sentence, uh, mention A was the subject of the sentence as opposed to being uh, maybe the indirect object of the sentence, then essentially we would know that uh, there's a higher probability that the, the pronoun in starting in the second sentence would refer to uh, the subject of the previous sentence. So uh, that's basically on the, sorry. Okay, um, that's a great place to, uh, stop for a minute. Let's um, go back uh, a couple of slides to uh, your mentioned pairs. And, um, you know, I'd like all of you to, to spend a couple of seconds thinking about, you know, what difficulties uh, or what features uh, we could use, you know, if we were to do it in the basic method, you know, the, the traditional machine learning method, and you come up with a bunch of features. So Xu Tian went over a couple of them. Can you guys think of any others that might be used uh, when you're doing co-reference resolution? So, uh, you know, we, we'd like you to participate. So just a shout out. Um, of course, you have to unmute, but uh, do shout out some, some things that you notice about this problem that could be useful. I'll just start with uh, some uh, references. So the, the original theory on co-reference resolution in NLP in the 70s and 80s came from the idea of using uh, something called centering theory. So centering theory basically says that um, when you talk about a topic, you continue to talk about it until uh, you, know, you switch to another topic. So the whole point about that is to say that, you know, if you're in a subject position, you know, you have a subject mention, that mention is much more salient and likely to go ahead and form a co-reference chain somewhere else. You know, if you have an object in a sentence, like I gave the book to Jenny, and I, and I, the book or Jenny is much less likely to be part of the continuing conversation because I'm talking about myself, okay? That was the whole point of centering theory. So, um, you know, Shuten already started with that, right? Um, can anyone else think of other types of uh, pieces of information that you might use to distinguish co-reference?
maybe the post tagging. Pause tagging. Okay, can you uh, give an example uh, of that? Yeah. Like what? What in a pause uh, output would help you? Yeah, distinguish? maybe the uh, the uh, post tagging. For example, uh, if uh, uh, if a word is a verb, then uh, maybe it's not a reference, right? Yes, because uh, reference uh, are usually nouns. Uh, Shuten has brought up mostly a uh, co-reference resolution for pronouns, right? This is the basic form, right? You have it, she, he in English, right? And you're trying to resolve uh, whether that uh, is co-reference to a particular noun. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there other forms of co-reference that you guys can think of? Or Shuten, I, I'm sure you've read some. What other forms of uh, co-reference resolution uh, are there? Um. I think instead of pronouns, there might be something like a, a mentioning of uh, like a red building uh, in, the, in the previous sentence. And then uh, in the later sentence, uh, it would just refer to it as the building. And it would kind of still need to sort of resolve these two uh, references into one. Exactly. So there's actually, co-reference is very complicated. There's a lot of different things. And actually, our teams at I2R have been doing a lot of this type of work. So for example, uh, you know, even sticking with pronouns, you have like Bob and Tim went to the, the center, but Jenny did not. They, OK, then you have to resolve who, who, who make up that pronoun. Or you, know, you could refer to groups of people. Uh, you know, the group decided to go to uh, Bakersfield to, to enjoy a, a, a lunch or something like that. And then you have to decide which, which people are the group, right? Uh, sometimes that's even hard for uh, you know, in, in normal context be there. Uh, references to parts or holes, you know, so uh, you can talk about the car engine uh, of the van, right, or something like that. Um, so that's also difficult. Um, also, uh, co-reference, so you can look up what that is, uh, where you uh, might refer to uh, entities that bridge across different uh, parts of mentions. Uh, there's also ent um, event co-reference, right? So you can talk about events or times and dates. Um, and then also actions, like um, the test Testing took place on uh, October 9th, right? And then you have to resolve it, it, right? So it, it again, nuances to that. Uh, it's much more complex, but normally when we're talking about machine reading or machine comprehension, we start with the big problem of um, pronominal co-reference. Now, those of you who are Chinese or are using other languages, you can think about how co-reference is done in your language like in Chinese you know you have ta but it's not always which which object or which person or which uh, animal you're, you're you're discussing about so there are some features in English that help um, there are some fi uh, features in other languages that help but they're not universal right okay so um again like I've told you guys many times when you go into uh, looking at the data, and you examine a problem, especially after you use a neural method and you diagnose a problem using the confusion matrix, right? Then you will get an idea of, okay, what, what type of information am I missing? Okay, because that's going to help you invent or, or uh, perturb the neural model a little bit so that you can capture the right information, right? So we've seen it before. You might use the sequence model and then uh, add a CRF layer on top, and the CRF uh, can take uh, specific uh, uh, feature engineering uh, mechanisms uh, to incorporate into the learning as well. Okay, so I, I just wanted to give you a little bit um, a larger picture about uh, how co-reference works. Okay, and um, you know there are lots of specific features about it, uh, and I think uh, Shuten is going to cover in the next five slides or so some of the neural model you guys to dialogue a little bit rather than it just be presentation uh, yeah 
Okay, um, so yeah, so uh, there's a lot of feature in en engineering and non-neural models. And then uh, moving on to older neural models, the idea is actually kind of uh, very similar. So we actually still use a bunch of features that are sort of uh, hand-engineered and uh, identified by uh, humans themselves. So in this case, uh, this neural model basically is just uh, so for candidate antecedent embeddings and mentioned embeddings, uh, it's probably just going to be something like an average of the word embeddings of the expressions themselves. And then uh, candidate antecedent features and mentioned features, again, uh, we can sort of relate back to uh, what we did in neural model, uh, non-neural models, that is something, if something is a subject of a sentence or something's an object of a sentence. And then for additional features, uh, again, th this can be something like sentence recency. So uh, there's actually, uh, the idea behind it is uh, actually very similar, and there's still a lot of pre-processing uh, involved in the older neural models. So all it does is uh, it kind of automatically learns the weights of the features themselves. So uh, these, these pre-processing steps uh, include like a uh, mention uh, detection. Uh, so you have to first detect dimensions in the sentence, uh, and after that, uh, maybe sort of do a POS tagging and dependency passing to identify uh, different sort of uh, parts, uh, different what what what's represent, for example, if they are, if they are subject of a sentence. Uh, so uh, more recently, uh, neural models have been focused on end-to-end uh, -end co-reference resolution. So um, they basically identify drawbacks in the pipeline systems that uh, I've mentioned. So firstly, of course, is the passing mistakes introduce uh, cascading errors. So like earlier errors in dependency passes might introduce errors that uh, can no longer be uh, solved in, in the uh, back of the system. and then. Uh, also, that hand engineered features do not generalize uh, to different languages. So, if you have a set of features that work very well in English, it might not necessarily work with non Germanic languages such as uh, Arabic or Chinese. Uh, so, what the model basically tries to do is uh, it tries to uh, learn the spans in a sentence, uh, which are entity mentions uh, automatically, and, and then after that, uh, do the normal clustering that uh, is required. Uh, yeah, so the general idea is to consider all the spans uh, in each sentence in the document. Uh, this sounds very computationally intractable, and which is why also that they actually have a lot of aggressive pruning uh, to make the system more practical. Uh, so yeah, the mentions files will be, uh, we'll go through it uh, in, in the later slides. So yeah, they also use a mention ranking approach instead of mention pairing. Right, so this is one part of their model. Uh, so if you think of, what they said about um, the spans uh, can encompass, like uh, that we consider all the spans in a sentence. So uh, this model is not rep really representative of uh, what exactly they're doing in the sense that uh, general can be a span, and then general electric can be a span, and general electric state can be a span, electric state the can be a span. Uh, so the bottom part of the model is pretty straightforward. It's a bi-directional STM with uh, word embeddings and character embeddings. So uh, essentially you will get a, uh, uh, representation of uh, each word that is a concatenation of the forward and backward uh, hidden representations of the LSTMs. And then uh, next, they would actually try to identify a head word uh, in, in a span, in an expression using uh, the attention mechanism. So a head word is basically sort of, it, it, I guess it kind of captures the meaning of the span. So for example, if I have something like older brother, then the head word will be brother, because older is just kind of a descriptive word uh, for brother itself. So uh, they, so yeah, they basically get the attention weights using uh, this uh, hidden representations. And then after that, uh, the, the final representation would basically attend uh, mostly to the head word of a span. So uh, the final representation of a span is uh, the hidden representation that is of, of the start of the uh, start word of the span, uh, the last word of the span, and then uh, this uh, this attention on the head word of the span. And then uh, the phi i over here, I think it's the length of the span. Uh, so it's an additional feature that is the length of the span. So with this final representation, uh, which is the green green thing over here, uh, they finally pass it through another uh, a neural network and then get sort of a mention score. So this mention score is basically to see whether uh, the, the span itself is actually going to be a mention. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's not the end of the model. Uh, so now so with the span, yes. So is the length of the span predetermined or? Because I see this. The first one is two. Then the second one is three words. 
Yeah, so it'll be, it'll be if it's general electric state, then it'll be uh, the representation for three words. Then if it's general electric, then it'll be two. Oh, no, no, I mean like at the top. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, that, that's why I said this model is not really accurate. I think uh, oh. they basically, uh, like general itself can be a span, and then electric itself can also be a span. But uh, to, to sort of illustrate that they kind of combine uh, like words together to become a span, they, they kind of just drew it this way. But how do they decide what what's a span? Like, how does the model decide? Uh, so they actually, yeah. So like previously, they said uh, I said that uh, like they consider all the spans up to a certain length. So it's very computationally intensive. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so the so the pruning part actually uh basically once they've gotten all the spans, they will just discard all those with like low mention scores, so that they only in in the in the later on uh, parts of the model, they only have to consider like uh, uh, whether uh, those that have high mention scores, whether they are antecedents of each other and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now with the span representation and the mention score, uh, they will try to get an antecedent score uh, between two different uh, mentions or two different spans. So the antecedent score is, uh, Again, they have a representation of the two uh, mentions, uh, and then they pass it into a neural network again. Uh, so yeah, this is the representation of the two mentions. I think uh, this feature vector over here is going to be something like uh, the, 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 I think, the distance between the two spans. Yeah. So yeah, so they basically get an antecedent score between. I think it's the feature vector. I think it's the feature vector encoding the speaker and genre information, right? Uh, as oh. basically the metadata information. If you look at uh, page three, um, I'll, I'll cut and paste it into the stack. Um, but it does include the distance. Basically, it's any like metadata feature that they're calculating. Um, so it includes span distance, yeah. But oftentimes you need all these other like manual feature engineering uh, type of features. Uh, you know, neural models probably don't learn all of that very easily. So um, at this stage in time, we still need to calculate some of these. So um, as you can see on the Slack, it does mention some of these things right. here. But like Shukian said, um, this this algorithm is very computationally heavy. It takes, uh, I think they said. Um, order quad quadratic not quadratic uh, to the fourth power t to the fourth power time because you need a uh, to decide the span and then you need to go iterate through all the spans for each possible link yeah yeah, <clears throat> uh, yeah so i guess this is uh, not completely end to end in in a sense because i guess then you have to kind of calculate uh, this feature vector between the two spans uh, and separately um, yeah, yeah and I then, think uh, so. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so uh, after you calculate sort of the antecedent score between the two, uh, the two mentions, then you will sort of calculate the conference score. Uh, so the conference score, uh, sorry, the co-reference score is going to be uh, uh, the scoring of the mention uh, I and the mention J, and then uh, whether they are, uh, one of them is the antecedent of the other, and then. Uh, I think this epsilon here is kind of uh, representative of the dummy, um, the dummy mention that I, I mentioned before uh, in in mention pairing, uh, in mention ranking. Uh, so if if this uh, essentially this co-reference score uh, becomes like a negative value, then essentially uh, then in the later stages it will just kind of uh, link it to the dummy uh, mention, and then at the very top it's a uh, it's a softmax of a probability distribution of uh, if I link uh, of all the links within uh, the the document. I think it's within the document. Yeah, it's within the. Yeah, so uh, I think the main contribution that they did here was basically this novel idea of actually being able to train this uh, using one entire model as a whole. And of course, uh, like uh, their results show that they perform much better than. Um, the previous models, which were pipeline methods. Uh, so I wouldn't be going to specific results. I'll just be talking about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of this end-to-end co-reference resolution model. Uh, one of the strengths that they identified was the importance of Hayward tension. So uh, 
we can see at one over here, uh, this same in the same sentence, uh, they got out uh, two different kinds of uh, two different clusters. So um, anything in a bracket is going to be anything in brackets is going to be co-referenced with each other. So uh, and then uh, the the amount of red shading of the word is uh, how much attention is given to that word as a head word of that, that span. So in the first uh, first example of the first um, kind of sentence. Uh, you see that the attention was given to fire in the first uh, span, and then the attention was given to uh, a blaze in the second uh, span. So that was kind of how uh, the model was able to identify that these two mentions were actually um, kind of uh, co-referent. And then in the second uh, example, in the first sentence, uh, now that the span uh, no longer includes the word fire, the, the attention uh, automatically goes to like factory, and then. Uh, later on, they identified a building as a headword of the four-story building, and essentially they were able to kind of link these two together. Uh, but <clears throat> one of the weaknesses as well of using sort of word embeddings is uh, if you look at uh, example three, uh, the flight attendants and the pilots were were co-referent in their model, but uh, essentially they're not. Uh, um, mostly it's because uh, they they propose it's because uh, attendants and uh, pilots are probably very uh, similar in terms of their uh, in in the word uh, embedding space, yeah, um, yeah. So that's basically uh, the paper on how to do a co-reference resolution uh, in a end-to-end -end manner. Uh, do you have any questions? Any questions from the floor? So I think this is a, a really good introduction. Uh, I think you, you can see that uh, you know they're actually quite um, codified, in, at least in English, rules to find heads of noun phrases. So uh, I, I think you can use those for the most part, even if you don't have an end end system, you don't need to learn um, the head word. But it does help because you can see here, uh, like in the, the second part of uh, number, the first sentence, um, the attention is a bit more spread out. It's uh, able to identify garment as a, a useful qualifier to factory, right? and that that's helping it uh, decide building. For example, if you have a, you know, uh, I don't know, in software engineering we have a factory, right? But but that's uh, an object creator. That type of factory wouldn't be co-referenced uh, with building. So I think that's one of the reasons why we. Um, the attention is a bit spread up to realize that Garmin factory is actually a type of physical entity, uh, which is co-referent to building. Okay, I mean, four-story, I, I would think is actually fairly useful too. Um, you know, it probably wouldn't be co-referenced if it was like a hundred-story skyscraper, but uh, you know, it, it might still try to do that. Okay, uh, also on example four here, you see, um, um, how the phrase structure is being used. You can see Prince Charles and his new wife Camilla, the head is and, right? So the and the conjunction is conjoining both of the component noun phrases. And, and so it's still being picked up as a uh, co-referent to Charles and Diana later, right? So the, that's quite interesting too, is that uh, even though the system is not being taught specifically any co-reference information about the phrase structure grammar or the uh, syntactic parse, it's still picking that up as useful, right? Okay, other other points that you guys want to make? Um, how come how come it's uh, focusing on the end? Shouldn't it be focusing on like nouns and pronouns? Or like proper nouns. Yeah, so you mean in number attention. four? Yeah, yeah, especially number four. Okay, so in number four, you have a conjunction of two NPs, right? So neither of those NPs oh. be ahead. But then the span should be down to that, right? You have Prince Charles as an entity, which you want to obviously propose as an entity at some point. Right, probably there's uh, another way that you could write a co-reference between Prince Charles and Charles, and Charles' first opportunity and his, right? So you can see all of those parts in, in that part. But they're not showing you that co-reference in here, right? But they're showing that that conjunction somehow is being uh, 
preserved as being a conjunction of two two humans, and then uh, it's being uh, referred to there, right? So I, I'm also not sure how exactly how it picks that up, but that is the the correct head for a noun compound. But you can see if you just use the word and as a, a head, you have to know the components, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Right. Right. You have to know what 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 goes into the component. Does that answer your question, or do you have some other things that you wanted to mention? How about the rest of you guys? Have any questions about this? Okay, uh, let's thank Shu Tian. I think uh, you uh, covered um, everything. Yeah, I, I'm just going to give a very brief recap on, okay. on dialogue because I think uh, my presenters, they thought it wouldn't just, would just be going through papers directly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, go ahead. Uh, so, so I think uh, this is just a very basic uh, recap on, on, on dialogue. So, a dialogue is basically a discourse between multiple parties since discourse is a grouping of sentences. And then, uh, two different kinds of dialogue systems, uh, task-oriented and chatbots. Uh, so the task-oriented dialogue system, the, the dialogue system will actually try to, um, I guess, uh, sort of accomplish a task such as uh, helping you find a restaurant in a nearby place. And uh, it's usually a pipeline method. Uh, so there's a natural language understanding that passes the user utterance. Um, utterance is um, sort of a basic unit of speech. So in, in a sense, I guess, you can just think of it as whatever is said in one turn of the dialogue. And then, uh, since it's task oriented, there are sort of predefined semantic slots. And then, so for example, the sentence, uh, show me restaurants at New York tomorrow. Um, so it would sort of pass uh, the intent of this sentence as uh, uh, find restaurants. And then after that, uh, sort of like maybe do sequence labeling and find New York to be the destination and tomorrow as the date. And then, uh, data state tracker is a kind of a high level uh, component where I, uh, instead of saying I only pass, uh, the current, uh, what is being currently said in one turn, I would just sort of create a belief state that encompasses the entirety of the dialogue and uh, take into uh, uh, consideration the entire context of the dialogue. And then using this kind of belief state, um, there's of course going to be a policy uh, that generates kind of an action that is going to be taken by the dialogue system. And then it will be passed to the natural language generation component, which will then uh, generate the natural language response to uh, the dialogue system, uh, to the dialogue, uh, to the user. Uh, so this is kind of a uh, task oriented dialogue systems. I heard there might be end to end uh, systems of task oriented uh, dialogue, but I'm I'm not exactly sure. Uh, yeah, uh, and after that, uh, so as opposed to task oriented dialogue uh, systems, sorry, Wen Chang and a couple part on end-to-end uh, -end dialogue systems. And uh, you know you brought up these two bullets, task-oriented and chatbot. So right now, um, these two different types of models are, have very different goals, right? And so they're not unified in any particular model. But um, in the framework that uh, they are working on is to bring these together into one, one unified end-to-end -end system. So if you wanted more details about that, um, you can ping Wen, Wen Chan on the Slack channel, and he he can share with you his draft that he's writing with his um, uh, peers to to um, yeah to to re publish that. Right. Um. Uh, yeah. So uh, chatbots is something uh, that uh, doesn't have a task at all. So he just tries to keep the conversation going, and. Uh, like uh, traditionally, people just use the sequence to sequence model, but then uh, of course there are multiple considerations, such as uh, it's not going to be as easy as something like uh, machine translation because uh, you there's no direct correspondence between the input and the output sequence, uh, so you have to take into consideration things like uh, context. Uh, yeah, so that's basically a, a very rough overview of uh, uh, dialogue uh, as a whole. And then uh, yeah, I just pass my time on to uh, the next presenter. Thank you. Hey, let's thank uh, Shichan for his presentation. All right, um, I'd like you guys, before we move on, because we've got a couple minutes here, 
um, to think about what are the differences between chatbots and task-oriented dialogue systems. I mean, um, can you characterize what what these two things are? I think people are more familiar with task-oriented dialogue systems, like um, even you know most telephone trees or or systems that you use have a, on an app or something are, are task-oriented, right? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest difference between a task-oriented and a general use chatbot is their aim, in a way. So in task-oriented chatbots, it's quite clear that the aim is to uh, be able to uh, successfully do what the user asks for. Uh, whereas in a, in a general use chatbot, uh, so a chit chatbot, in other words, uh, I think the task is to uh, create uh, responses that are uh, as natural as they can be and uh, also involve the user uh, in a conversation as long as uh, it can. Okay, yeah. So if you, you remember the Turing test, right? Uh, the Turing test was invented to uh, test whether machines achieve intelligence. And one way they uh, codified that was to think, you know, if you couldn't uh, distinguish a chatbot from a human, then it's considered passing, right? So when people first developed the idea of a chatbot, they were actually trying to tackle the Turing test. So it's always been about, um, you know, trying to fool a human into um, uh, the types of human communication that we would do. And that's very different from a chatbot, uh, I mean, a task-oriented bot. So can you guys um, just quickly brainstorm what types of information do you think a chatbot needs to keep in order to fool a person? What, what, yeah, what, what goes into the input, you know, uh, aside from the conversation turn that a human just spoke? So Shu Tian mentioned uh, one key part, uh, which is context. So what in the context is necessary for a chatbot? Any takers? Hello. Um, yeah. Go I ahead. think for a chatbot, um, context could be anything. Um, we don't have a limitation in the context, but in, in contrast, in the task-based uh, dialogue bots, um, our con context is limited. Um, so like, we actually do 10 or 20 things with the, as an outcome, but with, with the chatbot, the outcome could be anything. and we have to recognize input from any context. So we don't we have we have no dependency on the context. And our job is to satisfy everything. And um, I think it boils down to recognizing a non-context free language and becomes a like um, computationally maybe undecidable task to achieve. Because you you really don't know what what capabilities uh, does the human tester has. You you may fool some um, people with I mean limited knowledge or limited abilities in like forming complicated conversations, but it might be hard to fool a politician. I mean, just as an example. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can think, uh, so you guess point is good that it's basically a chatbot is unconstrained. And so many of the, the uh, chatbots, um, they do a lot of work to, to try to constrain where the conversation is going. So if you uh, look at any of these Turing test challenge chatbots, some of them have a lot of uh, knowledge about particular things. Like there is a, a chatbot that uh, pretends to be a grandmother with three cats, OK? And so uh, they have a lot of facts about cats. And if you try to get the chatbot to talk about anything else, 
it will still try to ask you about cats or talk to you about cats, probably like some of our grandmothers too, right? So, um, you know, uh, there's the other part that uh, Shi Chen brought up, which is that uh, you need context. So pretend you're having a conversation with someone who has Alzheimer's, right? Uh, they keep on forgetting what they've already mentioned. Right. And in a normal conversation, you have to keep context. Right. You have to remember what was spoken about in order for you to build on top of that. So that's a key part of, of chatbots is to maintain this state. So the dialogue state tracking information that uh, Shir Ten also brought up, that's more for task oriented uh, dialogue uh, systems is also very much a part. OK, but like uh, uh, you get also hinted at. You know, uh, think back to the first uh, dialogue system that you may have heard of. Um, one that, that most people in CS are familiar with is Eliza. Have, have you guys heard of Eliza? Okay, it's a system invented in the 60s. Um, it basically had a context, uh, regular, uh, regular uh, language uh, context uh, grammar. Okay, regular grammar. Um, and it recognized keywords and phrases, and then it spit back a template-oriented system response. If it didn't understand what you were saying, it would just produce a um, cooperative response like, hmm, I see, or that's interesting, right? So, um, you know, uh, you get this right to say you could potentially say anything, but the whole point of the chatbot, uh, as Shi Chen was mentioning, is to convince a person that, uh, you know, the 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 speaker or the chatbot was listening to you even if it had no understanding. Sometimes uh, my children also do the same with me. You know, when their their daddy is scolding them, they're just oh, yes, daddy, yes, daddy. Right? They don't actually listen. So this is the type of uh, a response that uh, convinces people that they're being heard. Okay. Any other comments that you guys want to uh, discuss on this uh, very brief introduction? Especially anyone who's working in dialogue, like Jachi or, or um, you know, Taha, if you guys have anything you want to bring up that is good to help everyone else in the group know what's going on. Yeah, maybe later uh, within the papers, I might have more okay. comments. All right, then let's go ahead to the next presenter. So um, who's up next? So we have a persona-based neural model, conversational model. OK, so Xiaoming is presenting. Yep, yep. So give me a while. So let me go to the slide. OK, so actually, I'll be discussing about uh, this paper, uh, persona-based neural conversation model. So it, it's a paper by Lee et al, 2017. And then it's actually, a, it's a, the purpose is to address a challenge with the data-driven dialogue agent, I mean, in in the response model. So uh, one typical problem is that uh, is a lack of consistency because the dialogue agent was built with training data and then the, the response to a specific question is the consensus response that you are able to find in the training data itself. For example, on the right, you can see that where do you live now, then the agent will say that I live in Los Angeles. And then if we tell me, if you turn it in another, another way, uh, the training data distribution might change and then the response you get is quite different and then inconsistent with the earlier reply. Like if you live in Madrid, but if you tell me another, if you tell me your question in another way, you, you say England. So he is trying to address this uh, consistency issue. Okay, so the aim is to actually provide a coherent persona, which can be a composite of multiple identities, like your language behavior, your integration style, what kind of words do we use? That kind of thing. Okay. Uh, okay. So in the paper, uh, the authors actually presented two models. The first model is a speaker model. So speaker model is actually uh, so speaker model. It doesn't really consider who you are talking to. So it just sort of like exhibit a certain consistent uh, behavior when you are speaking. And the speaker addressing model, it does take into account who are you speaking to. So for example, we are speaking to your to your peers, we're speaking to your to your girlfriend and whatever. I mean the the style might potentially change. 
And then this speaker addressing model is trying to address that. So it does consider the interaction between the two. Uh, yeah, and it adapt different style according to who are the speak, who are the who are the who are the one that you're com conversing with. Okay, the speaker model is actually sort of like an extension of uh, LSTM based sequence to sequence model, and then the idea is actually pretty straightforward. Okay, so the speaker is also represented using a uh, embedding vectors. You can see that on the on the lower left. Can see that the user embedding is actually embedded in the high dimensional space. So for these 70k users, I mean they are actually represented in uh they are the is actually the neural network is the user embedding is learned together with the whole neural network parameters. And then the user will be represented in this. So those users who are actually exhibiting similar speaking behavior uh tend to actually be close to each other so that uh and then this actually enhanced the generalization capability because if you say if you see Rob, maybe Rob is actually similar to uh, to another, another guy Adam. And then because they both live in, live in England, they have similar way of speaking certain thing. In the in the way in the speaker embedding, they might be close to each other. And then the way that the answer will be will be similar as well. Even though you never you never ask Rob where where does he live before, but be, but you asked that to Adam before. By considering that the Rob and Aiden is actually quite close to each other in the speaker embedding, you can uh, the agent can actually respond in a similar way to Rob, so that uh, so that you will be will be able to actually as be the consistent sort of like a consistent behavior. Since that this guy is similar to me, if I answer it in a similar way, I mean I will be consistent. Can okay. oh, uh, yeah. So next. So the speaker embedding is actually an embedding vector. And as I say, it's actually learned together with them, the whole neural network parameters. And, and you can see from the vector made from the matrix representation, actually this is the LSTM formula. The only thing added here is actually the VI. VI is a speaker embedding. Okay. So, so you can see that when you go through the neural network, the whole output becomes a mishmash. The, all the all the gate output are actually be, are actually a mismatch between the three the hidden the hidden states okay the wall embedding vector and also the speaker embedding vector speaker okay so the the other model that uh, the paper presented is a speaker addressing model so it does it the trick is that it now is now capturing the interaction representation between the two. So there will be a VIJ. I is a speaker I, J is the other speaker J. So to mix them together, uh, the, the user actually proposed the linear combination between the two. Okay, the VI and VJ. So you can see that there's a W1 and W2. Is actually the linear linear combination between the between VEI and VJ. Okay, so there's actually a typo here. So this W two V J is there. So uh, yeah. So then and then it go through the hyperplane tangent, and then this V I J like like the previous model is actually going to the matrix formula. So you can see the first the hidden state, the wall embedding, then the V I J is an interaction vector representation between the two. And the same thing is that this is learned to get this learned jointly together with the whole neural network. So that's uh, when you dig after at the decoding layer at the decoding layer, uh, because you how how do I decide the best response to give? Actually, is using this uh, bin search. Uh, the user proposed to use this bin search uh, strategy. It's a heuristic search strategy. So on the below, the image is actually uh, an example of how bin search is done. So. The, the image example is actually a bin search size of two. Like uh, when you have a start token, you will you will actually keep the if you if you're using a bin search of two, you keep the top two most probable subsequence. Okay, in this case, he and I. Okay, and the next and the next state uh, and and then the next token, you in the he and I, then you go and then you expand them out 
to see which which two subsequences are actually the most probable. In this case, he hits have a score of minus 0, 1.7. I was have a score of one, minus 1.6. These are the top two. So did he hit and I was will be further expanded in, in that sense. So so on and so forth until you as until you hit the until you get the EOS token. Okay. So this is how bin search is done. Uh, and the and the author is proposing bin search of 200, bin search width of 200. And the maximum response length, you mean the sentence length of 20, of 20. So it only keeps those, the stopping criteria is actually that uh, the, word to, the total number of word tokens will be less than or equal to 20. So for those word, for those sentences that stop at 20, you will be kept. And then this hypothesis uh, will be will be added to the MBEST list. You get this decoding, and then the next thing that, will, that you'll, be do, you, uh, they'll be doing is the re-ranking of it. Re-ranking because you have actually uh, n hypothesis, and then how do you rank that? Which hypothesis is actually more probable? And then you should output that one. That goes to the next one, which is re-ranking. So it re rank the MBEST list by maximizing the following scoring function. It's also proposed by Lee et al. in the earlier paper. 20, 2016. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, this formula later on, Samson, Samson will actually introduce further because this is actually the blandest thing. But let me let me go through very really quickly. Very quickly, is that the log likelihood? Okay. So the first one is the is a log likelihood of the of the response given the given the source sentences and the user embedding. Okay. The next one is the log likelihood. Of the probability of the log likelihood of the uh, source sentence given the response, and then the next one is the is the length of the sentence. This this actually the the shorter the, the shorter the response, there will be a penalty correspond to it. So we're trying to maximizing this score function and then use the use the best use the best this response with the best score and output it in the for the dialogue agent. Okay, and the uh, Probability of this P and given R, probability of uh, of the source given the response is really computed by training another inverse sequence sequence model. So there will be a trade off parameter lambda and gamma. These are also, these audible, these values are actually the user actually optimized using a blue score to, to actually tune these hyperparameters for the, the trading weights between the two. Okay, so the results, uh, going through, through it very quickly is that the, the speaker model, the sing, single speaker model was trained using Twitter conversation data. Okay, the speaker addressing, addressing model is trained using the, using a TV series transcripts so that there will be, uh, so that you have a, Okay, I mean in this in this case the TV series use is really friends and big bang theory. Okay. The performance wise single speaker model seems to perform better than the standard LSTM. And the speaker and speaker addressing model is actually of this of the similar performance. But the thing they want to look at is the consistency. Okay, which is which come this part. Hmm. Okay. So speaker model. Is able to achieve consistent dialogue. So you can see on the left is a single speaker output. So when it asks you where's your hometown, or or you or you turn the question any, any other way, like where do you live in, the kind of thing, it's able to give a sort of like consistent con consistent response on where he does where he lives, and so on and so forth, like the age as well. And the speaker addressing model is is able to adapt. Uh, respond to different listeners. Uh, like on the right, you can see that this is a speaker addressing model. So depending on who, depending on who the who who you are speaking to, you should add, add that different response. Like you're able to know that oh, I'm speaking to Emily, so I will just put that I love you, Emily, in there. And then the the other one, the other more interesting thing is the okay the the second last one, okay when is actually. It's actually able to, able to tell that the addressee is actually a guy, so there's uh, kisses him in there in the parenthesis. So this is uh this is 
yeah, that's true. So the result does show that it's able to achieve some consistency in in the in the in the messages, while actually while actually while actually obtaining a, actually a similar blue score. Yeah, and then that's about it. Yeah, that's all. That's all for my. That's all about this paper. Okay, thanks, Xiao Ming. So uh, let's let's be quick. The right hand side of this thing based on Tel Aviv in I think early two thousands or so. So um, the transcripts do have those types of actions like kisses him embedded in them. So basically, the LSTM is uh, doing some type of copy, you know, memorizing and copying and generating back uh, lines that are are due to the um, the speaker Rachel, right? And um, in in that series, I think Ross and Rachel are are, are boyfriend and girlfriend, if I remember correctly. So um, that's an appropriate line for that, but not for some of the other ones, right? So you'll notice that in some cases you have two significant others uh, that are, are are pretending to be the addressee and the speaker. So there are uh, names being uh, copied uh, from the history of the training data. Okay. Um, the other thing I, I would like you to think about is trying to generalize what Shu Tian talked about in the first half. Uh, well, first third, I should say, and what Xiao Ming said in this second part. So do you see any commonalities between both parts? I'd like you to concentrate on like um, meta themes that are coming out of the NLP uh, architecture, not so much the details. So anyone want to uh, say anything about what what types of information or, or um, things that you notice that are commonalities or differences between the two parts? Okay, so when I read this paper, you know, I, I find it, um, you know, mildly interesting uh, because they've got two parts that correspond very nicely to what Xu Tian said earlier, okay? So Xiao Ming introduced the speaker model, okay? And the speaker addressee model. Those are the two uh, innovations that this paper presented, right? So the first thing is to know who is uh, asking to generate speech, right? The speaker model is important because we can customize uh, what types of vocabularies could, could be more prevalent for a certain speaker. And if you read the paper that's on Slack, right, uh, you'll see that the way they did it is train Twitter conversations, right? And the Twitter conversations, uh, even without information about geotagging, uh, like where the uh, users come from, it picks up uh, through the word embedding information, differences in the vocabulary. And then some of these dialogues actually do have uh, geolocations in them, right? Uh, not not tagged, but just as word mentions like England or London, okay. So that's why you know somebody who speaks with a more um, English uh, vocabulary might be picked up as living in the UK or in London, right? That's what it said, okay. So that's the speaker model, and then the speaker addressing model is customizing that a bit more. It's saying, okay. I have two pieces of information, and I need to encode some information about uh, that particular conversation. Okay, that these two people are dialoguing with each other, and just like Xiao Ming mentioned, like the way you speak to your peer, or the way you speak to your significant other, the way you speak to your parents, or the way you speak to your supervisor, they're probably a little bit different, right? You use different vocabulary. You might be more formal or less formal with one or another. Okay. So adapting to that is also uh, possible. I mean, in their model, they didn't explicitly encode like formality again, because it's an end-to-end -end model. It just says, okay, take these two uh, people and then uh, try to condition on any uh, you know, side information that might be useful to encode when trying to uh, improve the loss, right? Uh, uh, lower the loss when generating responses. Okay, so I hope you see a correspondence between the speaker model and the speaker addressee model with the first part that uh, Shu Tian mentioned. So Shu Tian mentioned the mention uh, 
the span detection, right? So the span detection is to detect an NP or, or something that could refer to as a mention, okay? And then there was this other part that said just an antecedent, right? So I have a pronoun like him or her, okay? And I have an antecedent like the company or Bob, right? And there is some model about this pair that is going in to the model to decide whether it's co-reference or not, okay? So in that earlier paper, the, the job was to decide whether something is co-reference or not. On the condition on the fact that these two might model one piece of information, another piece of information, and then the edge connecting both nodes somehow we encode some type of useful relationship quantity that you want to uh, figure out how to utilize, right? Here it's say, I want to customize the vocabulary choice or the grammatical um, uh, creation of a sentence that's uh, uh, embodied by that, okay? Whereas in the first part, um, you know, we're basically trying to decide co-reference on that edge. Okay, so uh, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about graph-based models, okay? So you can think of this in sort of a graph-based manner, right? You have a whole bunch of uh, people, okay? And any of them can have dialogues between them, right? And basically when we're uh, saying that, you know, the speaker A and the speaker B, and we're, we're gonna put them in a dialogue together, it's taking those two nodes and then drawing the link between them. Right? And just like in uh, GCN and GAT, the, the placement of these speakers inside the graph, right? because we have some ideas of speakers embeddings in, in this paper, right? Uh, could give you some other side information about how to encode that effectively. So it's not been exploited to my knowledge, you know, using GCN or other graphical models for this type of speaker uh, uh, um, attentive uh, generation, but it's definitely something that can be done, okay? So I think, you know, when we cover GCNs and, and graph-based models, there's an, a natural inclination to see uh, the possibilities of some of these works being generalized with a graph method, okay? And then, of course, the, the type of work that you would want to do is to, to think about, okay, what is naturally um, encoded by a graph? Okay, what things do I leave out? Like in this particular paper, uh, the embeddings were separated, right? Basically, these two uh, uh, boxes from the, the, the LSTM figure a couple slides ago, I think slide 16, right? Um, basically, showed the embedding space as being completely separated from the graph, okay? They just learned these separately, okay? But they could be embedded together, all right? So um, I'd like you to think about your own problems that you're doing as researchers for NLP or, or, or you know, in, in deep learning in general, and think about, okay, is there a representation um, that requires this type of um, uh, nuance, right? Do I need to encode a particular entity? Do I need to encode that entity's relation to another entity, right? So in co-reference resolution, it was the mention and antecedent. Here, it's the speaker and another speaker. Okay, and you can see the two different models that came about from here. Here, uh, it's just, you know, using the LSTM, putting a loss in the other one, and because it was a classification model, it was a little bit more complex than that, and they had to consider a whole, um, a whole very large uh, uh, quadratic space of, uh, uh, of different possible spans, right? Here, you don't, right? Basically, you're just including speakers. Okay. So uh, I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, I, I want you guys to generalize from these papers and think about what's the common strategy that um, different papers are taking when they approach these problems. Other comments? So actually for the speaker model, it's kind of using the dialogue history to kind of infer the profile of the speaker, right? But what if it's like at the start, it has like no data at all, right? Uh, okay, so for this paper, it's actually the, the data set actually handpicked for, for those with, with data. 
So this is a Twitter data set. So let's say the 70K more, more the 70K users in the paper, they are actually being, uh, actually picked the Twitter data set that already has some conversations in there. Rob, I think you're frozen. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, you're talking about the data set on uh, the paper, right? On page five. Uh, yes. I just speaking for about for this uh for for this for the approach that I take. Yes, I mean to learn the user embedding, you need the conversation history to learn about the user. So for these seventy k users, they are uh, the user the the authors actually have actually pre curated a Twitter Twitter data set, Twitter conversation between between a few users, and then each user will have uh let's say about I think twenty respond twenty to and fro responses or something, so that uh so that the neural network can actually pick up the sort of like the user embedding for these users so this model yes i mean you need the you need the chat history to actually learn the embeddings right so that means at inference time it's not learning any embeddings right i mean it's not like it's not inferring a model from let's say the person it's talking to at inference time if the person is a new person yeah you will you will not be you'll not be able to do this thing ah. if the uh, when during test time is actually also the sense for users when they are testing so this speaker i i want to generate a response for this i want to generate my dialogue response just like what rob has done before because you can learn the user embedding for rob you want to actually speak like rob yes you can do that but if you if the previously unknown person un, unseen person like in the speaker addressing model if you are speaking to somebody that is actually you haven't seen before you don't know the embedding then you will feel but you can use you can actually look up the embedding to say that oh i want to i want to pretend that this agent is speaking to let's say ross so i use my use my use this user embedding in there to generate the kind of responses so in the speaker addressing model you need that you need to know who you are speaking to in order to generate the, the appropriate response Right. Okay. Got it. So I'll emphasize too, because it's an embedding model, you can interpolate between users, right? So if you wanted to create a new personality, like taking friends as an example, where it would be somebody between Chandler and Ross, uh, you could do that, right? You could just, uh, draw a vector that's somewhere between the two of them and pull that out. But uh, yes, Samson, you're right to say that if you have an entirely people going in, um, it would not be easy to bring. Uh, we can't really hear what you're saying. It's kind of like just muffled. The general speaker model. Um, but if you did have some segment, okay. Um, so, I don't know. We didn't hear your last, last few you sentences. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'll try to say it again. Um, okay. But can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, just let me know again. Okay. Then I'll repeat. Okay. Okay. So, Uh, that it can correlate between two parts. Can you guys hear? Uh, yeah. Is, yeah, that's better. Is it any clearer now? Yeah, it's yeah. It's better. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the video is sucking up the bandwidth. Okay, so um, if you don't need to, I mean, if you have a, you want to just simulate a new user because you can interpolate between the two embeddings, right? So if you wanted to create a new personality between uh, Ross and Chandler in the friends example you could do that okay uh, but if you have a completely new speaker uh, 
then it's difficult, right? Because you don't have any information um, to guide uh, where in the embedding space you want the speaker to be. On the other hand, let's say you had some metadata about the speaker, like you know um, that the speaker is from Singapore, right? Then it's possible to use that site information and project it into the uh, speaker embedding space and then try to uh, pull out a speaker that would say those words, right? You could say, maximize the probability that that a person would say Singapore and then use whichever vector would say that and then um, that would be the speaker. Right, so just just by uh, you know coincidence, maybe a person from Singapore says uh, chicken rice more often, uh, right? So then maybe if you ask them what what did you eat for dinner or lunch, maybe they would say chicken rice. Right, like so it's like the the warm start thing. Yeah, it's like a warm start because you're learning from other data, right? You're taking the data that. Uh, comes from the corpus. So it's going to like pre-training uh, uh, a corpus of uh, conversations, right? And then pulling out data from there to help you uh, characterize the speaker. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. So uh, let's start. Uh, thanks, Xiaomen, for the presentation. Thank you. And um, we'll go on to, uh, I think, our last presenter, which is, I think, Samson. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking a uh, I'll be presenting on like two papers about the dialogue response generation, mainly focusing on the challenges rather than the generation itself. So I think one of the key issues that is probably still going on is like this idea of response blandness. So what res what blandness means is that the responses are valid, but then they are kind of useless because and like as you can see from the examples here like that the question is what are you doing or what is your name and saying i don't know is a valid response but then i mean it doesn't it doesn't it kind of defeats the purpose of the conversation right if you just say i don't know then the conversation just stops yeah so so that is a that's a key problem for response generation and that is because of the way that we are training models usually because when you train it in like the, the maximum likelihood estimation kind of way so you're maximizing the input given the you know maximizing the output given the input right and that promotes a lot of safe responses because like if i just give you a response that works all the time then then my my this y given x probability will always be high still. So, but then, then that's not what we want. So, this paper proposes this thing called maximum mutual information, which is basically like a fancy way of saying we want to account for that overall probability of y in the first place. So they do it in two ways. They either directly, they directly subtract the um, unconditional probability of the output from that conditional probability or they actually maximize also the probability of the input given the output so like the other way around then they they add it to the original to the to the, the standard loss and the disadvantage of the first solution is that it from from the paper, it seems that it generates like some ungrammatical sentences. So I think what people what they what they propose doing is also adding like a lambda here to control. Can you see my cursor actually? I I can't see your cursor, but maybe other people can. Oh, uh, yeah, you need the pointer like. 
Yeah. Can you see my cursor now? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what what they suggest is adding a lambda here on the to to kind of control this overall probability. So, I mean, if it's zero, then it just becomes the same as before, right? But then, but then you can kind of control how. You, it's like a trade-off between ungrammatical sentences and like safe but useless sentences. Yeah. So the the other approach is is to um, that they, they say that it seems to generate good sentences, but then it it's not very tractable to like train it directly because in order to calculate this second probability you need to generate y first so it's like a chicken and egg problem because you, you need y to calculate p to calculate x given y but then you're training it like to get y in the first place but then you're training this whole function to get y so yeah so how they get around this is uh, they first uh, they first generate the like a list of y's using the first the first part so using this y given x and then they re rank they kind of rank that list using the second object the second probability so then after that it, i guess it, it becomes a bit of like a mini max game or is it a, yeah or maxi min yeah Yeah, so so the, the idea is pretty simple and they, they show that it seems to work. So this is the this is the input. This is the output from a standard sequence to sequence model. So as you can see, there is a lot of very uh, general and not very useful responses. And here they use the the first approach. So it seems to be better than the than the than the normal sequence to sequence but yeah it, sometimes it doesn't really make sense either <laughs> and the bottom one they they use the second approach so interestingly it, it seems like the bottom one seems to have like shorter sentences in general. Yeah. Yeah, so so these are these are two so this was a pretty early paper in 2016. And I think people have been pretty much kind of using been using this idea in different ways after after that to kind of tackle the problem of blends. Do you have any questions about this paper? Otherwise, I can go to the next one. Yeah, it's a good idea to stop and just make sure everyone's clear about the roles of X and Y in the paper. As you can see from the, the title in the caption, they use source and target rather than X and Y. Oh, yeah, so, that is true. Uh, the source is yeah. The, yeah, the, the piece of information that is uh, coming in, you know, the speaker previous, and the target is what the chatbot is trying to generate, right? So you're given another instance S, and you're trying to condition on S to generate T, right? So you're given X, which is previous utterance, and you're trying to uh, derive Y, yeah. right? So that's that's the, the normal conditional probability, but what Samson is saying is that uh, they're conditioning it on it the other way, right? To, to say that, um, you know, um, we, we could think of it as, uh, if you generated a response, what would be the words that would make that would make sense to have responded to? Right? So you're saying that I've already generated the response, I've already gotten my Y, and I want to uh, maximize the probability of X, right? So this this uh, loop sequence that Samson is talking about. Yeah, uh, I have one question. Go ahead. Uh, so how how uh. As the paper says, uh, how how we compute uh, px uh, px given y? P oh so px 
so the PIs given Y is what they do is they generate like let's say n candidates using the PY given X then they just compute the probability of like let's say this given like each of those individual sentences so that that's like a score right then they just rank the responses and give the best so uh, yeah yeah so it becomes yeah. like a two-step process uh, yeah but i mean uh, how do you compute the score i mean uh, given one candidate and uh, one candidate y and uh, x how do you can compute the score between these two mm, i guess couldn't you use like a blue or something or maybe no wait you shouldn't use blue right yeah, yeah. No, this I'm is log they're just log probabilities, so it depends on the corpus, right? I don't think they're using any type of blue score for this. Yeah. So I mean, uh, with any type of log probability, the problem comes in coming uh, coming up with the normalization constant, right? Because anytime you need to normalize, you have to divide through all possibilities. So uh, I, I guess they have some standard trick that they're using to do that. Uh, uh, but Niangming, can you detail more what you mean by how to calculate that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, how uh, how does the paper rep represent this probability p x given y? Because uh, uh, whether they use a neural network or use other kind of similarity scores, uh, how, uh, I mean, what is the specific form of uh, of this p x given y? Okay, so that is in the paper. Uh, they actually just calculate it directly. Uh, I think they do it uh, based on a corpus, and, and maybe they do some model smoothing for the, the n-gram parameters so that you don't get zeros. Uh, but it is, uh, as, as what I think, uh, it's just uh, the actual probability within the corpus of, of how, how often those uh, responses are seen with each other. Oh, okay. I mean, they they are computed through a sequence to sequence model. So I guess, uh, you know, the sequence to sequence model probably generates a a probability score, um, and they're taking the probability score from the the final layer, um, uh, right? Uh, in order to get a an idea of which which responses are more likely. Mm, okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'll copy it in here. There, there is the formula. This is on page, let's see, page three. And uh, hopefully now that my video is turned off, it will come out. Okay, so I think it's on Slack already. Uh, it's just looking at the LSTM's output um, before it goes through the softmax to declare the winner. Right? So it's just telling you, I've seen the sequence X, and I'm just conditioning on that to uh, to output uh, a particular word y and write, and I, I'm going to do this over all of the the k. Right, but that's um, y given x, right? It does, that's not x given y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're asking about x given yes. y, not yes, y given sure. x. Ah, okay. I see. Yeah, I think it's it's still very similar. I don't think they. They have said some much about that, but like Samson was saying, I think uh, you said they just look at a uh, they use the uh, x given y uh, as a re-ranking over the possible y's that it's generating, right? Which yeah. it could have been done through um, some type of beam search, right, to decide which which y's would be feasible to re-rank. Let's see, is it in the paper anywhere? If you guys see it, you can paste it on Slack. Let me see. So, I think maybe they don't actually back propagate from the other. Maybe yeah, maybe they don't actually like back propagate through like the full thing because they said it's intractable, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess maybe they just generate the the y. Uh, what do you call it? they generate y given x then they compute the x given y then after that they just use the one that they found to be the best 
from that second computation to do the back propagation. Does that make sense? <laughs> Because they don't, they don't actually say how they calculate the x given y. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't see it either. Yeah, they, they just say why they're doing it. Yeah, I don't think they, they tell you exactly, but I can yeah. ask. Yeah, this is the Microsoft team um, that does it, is doing this work. Mm, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, but but this part is especially very important. I, I don't I don't know why 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 they didn't mention. <laughs> Let's see whether this paper has any um, appendices. Let's go. No, it doesn't. Mix. It just ends at the references. Yeah, it was an NAACL paper, and I'm looking at the ACL anthology. It doesn't have any. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, for my for my understanding, uh, uh, in, in uh, if if it's in solution one, uh, if we want to calculate p y, then we can use a standard language model to do that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, if for solution two, if we want to calculate, uh, the second term, uh, p x given y. Then uh, maybe we need a sequence to sequence model, uh, which use y as the input and output x, and then and something like this. I don't know. I'm not sure. That would be a good way to do it, actually. Right? You just train. train yeah, maybe just flip it and train. <laughs> yeah, train an LSTM to generate the query given the response. Right. So you pretend you didn't hear the response. Uh, then you're given the response and you generate back what was asked in the past term, right? And you can maximize over that type of um, score to generate this uh, y given x. Yeah, yeah, this is one way I can think of. Yeah, but but they, they didn't mention it. Yeah, they didn't mention it. Would it be okay, possible well. to actually use some other kind of methods like uh, approximate inference methods to calculate it. Yeah, I think you that's, that's, usually, that's usually like the first thing I would think of rather than sequence to sequence model. Mm. That, that also makes sense. Uh, I think the key yeah, yeah. idea is that you just need an approximate probability, right? It, it, it may not be exact. I mean, probably even if it was exact, it would not be a good representation because uh, of sparse data. So you probably have to generalize. Yeah, I guess yeah. you just want something to differentiate between the end, the end sentences rather than like an absolute score. All right. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is an important point uh, which they raise, right? Is that uh, you know conditioning on uh, on the pairing allows you to incorporate more specific information. I mean, if you read the, that particular part of the paper, they do tell you why they think that's a good idea. All right, this is on, I think, page three, um, uh, which says something like, this avoids favoring responses that unconditionally enjoy high probability, instead biases towards those responsible that are specific to the given input. You know, they have some, they're taking context into account, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's important. Now, if you wanted to take more context into account, you could. So an, an extension of this paper that you can easily think about is not just a condition on the, the previous um, query, but even the last term that you've generated or the query before that. And a lot of sequence-to-sequence -sequence models tries to do that, right? You, you use the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model to encode all the state information up until the current time point. That's typically what the dialogue state tracker system does, right? It's a sub-module that takes care of what was said in the context. You know, if you're talking about a task-oriented dialogue system, you would say, okay, the person has told me they want to fly from Boston. They've already told me that they want a 6 p.m. flight. Okay, so that's encoded into the context. And then you'd have to feed that. Um, every time you're generating a response, you'd have to take the entire dialogue state uh, that you're tracking into consideration 
phone generated response. So this is sort of like a very simple method, right, to say that uh, I want to condition on um, the previous utterance, right, what was said in order to generate it. But actually for that, don't, don't you just like add it all to the source? So like X, so you just in, like X is instead of the previous turn, it's like the whole history. Yeah, you, you certainly could. Uh, you yeah. certainly could. Many times you might want to encode this hierarchically because like if you use the single LSTM to do that, uh, it loses information about utterance boundaries, right? Right. So uh, it will just encode an LSTM, of course, remembers the last couple of things you said much better than anything before. So if you have a hierarchical LSTM or something like that, it'll remember little bits of the previous parts of the conversation from previous turns, right? Because you have an LSTM over a bunch of LSTMs, right? And then that right. can be helpful in, in uh, recalling key things that happened in the previous turns. It's sort of like the same idea that Shu Ten uh, talked about earlier, where we were trying to discern the heads of noun phrases or spans, right? So um, uh, if we can um, abstract away from uh, a conversation in turn and then say, okay, these were the key words that happened from a particular conversation turn. Then uh, you know, if I remember a couple turns of those keywords, that can help me generate a response. I think uh, some of the popular systems also do uh, like at each iteration, treat both the last utterance and uh, some number of uh, history. Like I don't know, maybe they have a window size of ten, and they both feed the last utterance and the last ten utterances. So that's another way to, I guess, uh, approach it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, thanks, Taha. Mm -hmm. OK. Shall I move on? Are you all OK? Yeah, I think we can go on. OK. Uh, yeah, so the next paper is, I think, also by the same person. It's also by the Microsoft group. So what they do is similar, if you, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with GANs, but it's similar to like a GAN framework, but using RL because you can back propagate through the sentences. So essentially, it's they're trying to simulate like a Turing test type of situation where the generator generates an utterance. So given, so in this case, it's using the whole dialogue history. And, and then there's a discriminator that tries to predict if this dialogue is uh, machine or human generated. Yeah, so, so they use the reinforced algorithm for this a, so it's a policy gradient method, so you can just run it on the on the sequence sequence model. And so so actually so here so this is the the objective function and the reward is actually the the probability that this particular dialogue that was generated uh this particular utterance that was generated is a human generated one. So that that's output that's uh that comes from the discriminator and so then it feeds back into the generator. Yeah. Are we clear on this? Okay. Yeah, so but the, the problem with doing this as with uh, most RL things is that it's not very stable. So I think although they really tried, so a standard trick for, for these um, RL type of training is to first gener to first train the sequence to sequence model in like a standard maximum likelihood estimation way, and then use that to initialize the policy for the, for the reinforcement learning algorithm. So because the parameters are the same and somehow it works by like, yeah, so, so somehow it works. So that, that's what people have been doing. 
but they still find that it's uh, unstable because they so so let's say given a sentence they they calculate it's only when they only get the reward when the entire sentence is generated so 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 yeah so it's like you get a re you get one reward per sentence where Whereas you know, when you are generating the sentence, it's like a step by step thing. Right? It's like a word by word thing, right? But then when you only get one reward for the whole thing, it's like your 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 each token that you generate or each word that you generate gets the same reward, no matter how um, relevant or how human like it is. If we use their terminology. And then, and this results in uh, unstable training, because, and, and also because they they are using the, because in RL you kind of approximate the expected reward, right? You calculate the expected reward, and that's calculated by only using this one sample. So, so it uh, from from what from my background knowledge, it, it likely results in high variance. That's why the training is unstable. So, so this isn't mentioned in the paper. This is what I think. Yeah. So, so their solution is to have a reward for each token that is generated instead of instead of uh, waiting until the entire sentence is generated. So uh, I guess there's a final signal. Yeah. You saying something? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, want to mention a few things about what you said. Uh, like uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of problem is a very general problem for uh, for uh, reinforcement learning uh, in uh, NLP. So, because mm -hmm. uh, when you re use a reward, uh, uh, actually there are two major problems uh, when you use a GAN uh, for uh, for natural language generation. Uh, the first is uh, what you mentioned here. Uh, it has a very unstable training because, uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like you said, uh, because the reward is uh, not a token, uh, token is not on token level but uh, on the sentence level, so it will have a high variance, so uh, which makes the training very unstable. Uh, and another problem is that. Uh, uh, you will suffer from a kind of uh, a problem called a uh, mode, uh, mode dropping, uh, uh, which means that uh, uh, when you uh, after you train the model, will tend to generate very general uh, general sentences like like, like I don't know uh, because uh, 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 because when the model learns that I don't know is acceptable uh, 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 and will get a high reward, you will keep generating these sentences uh, to maximize the reward. For um, mode collapse, right? Yeah, yeah, mode collapse. Uh, yeah. yeah you, uh, so the model will eventually learn to keep generating similar sentence to to fool the discriminator. Uh, so, as, uh, which is another problem of this kind yeah. of training. Yeah, that, that's a gain problem in general. Yeah, that is very similar to what uh, this blandness criteria that Samson said before, right? Basically, that the the generator uh, starts to generate things that it knows it can fool the discriminator, but it's not actually helping to to make more convincing dialogue. Because this it can be solved by uh, a model that pays attention to the um, the particularities of the samples rather than trying to collapse them all into a single mold, right? It's also a little bit similar to like um, if you remember the transformer architecture, you have multi-head attention. That's mm -hmm. the exact same reason, right? So you have multi-head attention for the uh, for the purpose of saying that different types of uh, problems will need to pay attention to different parts of the sentence. So that's why you have multiple heads, right? So mode collapse happens when you only have a single head. You know, you're trying to push everything into a canonical representation. So many times we solve this type of problem in neural networks the same way. Say, okay, actually, let's let's just allow it to have multiple multiple meanings or multiple focus. Okay, right? Just like uh, in words since disambiguation, you, you, you can use the context to disambiguate and have a contextually dependent model 
for for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the solution to tackle this problem is having a reward for each token or each generation step when when you are generating the terms. And the two two ways of doing this either you firstly have a I mean the most straightforward way is having a discriminator that can they can operate on a partial utterances so like, yeah partial sentences or the other way is you can kind of use Monte Carlo search to generate the rest of the sentence then from there you can uh, like just generate many many samples and then use that to calculate the expected reward so that will deal with the high variance problem. It's I mean it's kind of like data augmentation, I guess you can. You can. Yeah, it's a form of data augmentation, and I guess Taha can also talk or relate to, relate about his research that he's doing with Nancy and myself about uh, data augmentation for dialogue. Taha, do you want to say any words about what you're doing? I'll start again. I was looking at the paper, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was saying that uh, you are doing research on data augmentation too. Oh, yeah. We were talking about problems with high variance when we are training with just one sample. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, Samson was relaying this information about um, this work by the Microsoft team using GANs. So uh, maybe you could oh. speak a little bit about your own research about how to augment data for that. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I've been doing some uh, literature search for the topic like for the for the last week, I think. So yeah, my I, I don't have my uh, results yet, but I can say that uh, like according to the, the most of the uh, papers that are discussing on it is so most of the sequence to sequence or like data driven approaches in general uh, are doing a good. Uh, job on the diversity of the uh, responses that are generated, but then uh, the the thing they are lack lacking is the naturalness and the uh, correctness in both the grammatical and uh, semantic way, and so people thus are using uh, more template based uh, approaches in the industry, and. Yeah, in order to in order to do that, uh, the uh, as as Min just mentioned, the augmented data is quite a common way uh, to basically generate the, the the templates and not not just generate but populate actually. And yeah, uh, I think there's some uh, paper that we with Samsung also using now in our project I'll just post it to the Slack channel so people can look and yeah so that's pretty much it okay yeah I think we can go on yeah okay so so for these two approaches the Monte Carlo actually turned out to be better. Like it, it, it helped the model um, generate more, uh, or rather, generate better sentences. So okay, so maybe this this is not really accurate. It's more like better better generation. But the the problem is that it's very time consuming because you you have to like keep doing this sampling for each utterance that you generate. So, so you can expect that if you, you're going to generate like, let's say, 10, 10 utterances, then it's going to increase your computation time by 10. Because, and depending on how many uh, tokens you're going to, to generate as well to complete the sentence. And the, and the second approach is to train that discriminator 
So the advantage is faster, but then for some reason the discriminator becomes less accurate. And what they do with this is actually, in order to prevent, I think, overfitting, they... Oh, okay, so, so this accurate thing is more on the discriminator. So, so that's why I, read, I wrote more accurate. Is the, the discriminator is more accurate than using the second approach. And for the second approach is they're using... Oh, so, so what they do is they only choose one subsequence for, for each of these examples. So they say that it's supposed to prevent overfitting. Yeah. Um, any, do you have any questions or do you want to talk more about this? No? Okay. Yeah, so the other than, so even with uh, this, these two solutions, uh, the perplexity still shoots up. So according to the paper, it, after a few hours, it shoots up. And this is probably due to like vanishing gradients. I guess since they're using a LSTM, so maybe that could be why. But I think GANs also have this issue. But I tried training that, GANs. That is definitely a general GAN issue. Yeah. Right? If the discriminator cannot be pulled, then uh, you know, your generator is dead in the water. It doesn't get a vector, uh, sorry, a gradient to learn how to improve. It just basically your teacher is just always scolding you, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing it poorly. You're doing poorly, but not giving any direction about how to. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what they say. So, uh, so it's like very fragile because once it accidentally missteps, then. The, the discriminator quickly catch, catches on and then the, the generator is like, oh, I don't know what to do, I give up. And then it just goes downhill from there. Yeah, so there are lots of solutions to this that people have tried. I, I, I wonder if any of you have come across any before I, I talk about them. So if you, you have any ideas, uh, please raise your hand or just unmute and talk. Right. One very simple way that people do it in GANs is to freeze the discriminator from training at the beginning. Right. You just say, okay, uh, well, I give you a, a discriminator, but it's going to be pretty weak. And the whole point about this pretty weak discriminator is to help give some gradient uh, so that the generator can improve. After the generator starts to get fairly good, then you release the discriminator and you say, okay, I'm going to allow you to, to now train better. Right, and to, to customize mm -hmm. it and follow the direction that the generator is going in. Right? Uh, another way, of course, is to, to add more samples at the beginning. You know, don't, don't train just on one or two samples where you can. You might use synthetic data to do that. Um, and, and then uh, uh, allow the generator to get better at the beginning. All of those are just to affect that, that type of uh, problem. Of course, uh, you know, with GANs, uh, because they're so computationally intense, uh, why not use more computation? So you can just do it multiple times, right? So uh, we can we can still make the climate hotter uh, by doing all those types of um, you know, random restarts and, and not worry about these cases, right? If, if it does uh, deteriorate, you just throw away that training batch and start again. Right, but but then wouldn't it? I guess it's like a random chance thing, right? Because uh, I mean, if it it was not too stochastic, then you would end up at the same spot again, right? <laughs> you might, but I mean, these models are so multi-dimensional that you're probably falling into some local minima. Right. So, the hope is that uh, you know that, that most of the times you restart, you can you can converge to something reasonable, and that's easy to detect, right? Because your, uh, I mean, your generator and your uh, discriminator uh, have different uh, losses, and you can see whether uh, the complexity or, or the, uh, whatever is, is doing well or not. So it's easy to discriminate when things are going bad. But it, it is uh, very much like uh, uh, Liaoming and you both said, which is like the training these things is not particularly easy. They're very fragile. And so you need uh, best practices for doing RL, especially for NLP, are still uh, 
very much not not a cookbook yet. You know, there are small things here and there that people have tried. Yeah. So, so actually, their solution is to alternate between the RL objective and the normal log likelihood estimation. The, I mean, the maximum likelihood estimation. So, yeah. It, so they say that it's kind of similar to teacher forcing in NMT. Actually, they they, they discovered that it was actually similar to that. So like sometimes. Sometimes you just give it the whole input and calculate the ML. Yeah, so so that seems to address their issue. Yeah, that's not yeah, oh, good. Sorry. But uh, Go do, do these two objectives like uh kind of update the same parameters, right? Yeah, so yeah. so so actually, because when you're using policy gradient, the parameters are the same, right? Mm. So, what, like, yeah, so it's just a difference in the objective. Like oh, the paradigm changes, but then the parameters are the same thing. Mm. I see. Yeah. yeah, so that's why they can do that pre-training thing using mm. the standard function, uh, standard objective, and then after that, switch to this. I see. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit mind boggling that this works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the last paper will be on but uh so it's like res it's called it's on response coherence and also diversity. Yeah. So you can see in so it, so I showed I show you some of the like qualitative results first. So it seems like they don't really have any quantitative results for this paper. But yeah, so they they the so response coherence is supposed to be like with I guess within the sentence itself and maybe also with the prompt. So here you see with the baseline, it just keeps generating the same thing. Here and here, it it also it kind of it kind of just rambles. So, but with their method, it is more coherent. If that makes sense. Yeah. So, but sometimes it's. It's also fine. So in this case, so in some cases it's also also fine, but in some cases it's uh, not like this. So how they propose um, addressing the coherence problem is, they say, oh, we have attention in the decoder. I mean, we have self attention in the decoder. So. Norm, so the normal model has attention from the decoder to the encoder, right? Like attention on the encoder states. But here what they're doing is they kind of add this decoder states into the encoder and then so they do attention on it. So I mean, so it's basically self-attention because it's attending to its own input. And they also do this in an interesting way i don't know why but they instead of kind of generating the whole sequence at once they just generate it bit they, they generate like a fixed length so it's almost like a transformer like they, like you are, they generate a fixed length and then they append it and then they generate the next the next piece and then they put it into the encoder and then they replace this so it's like a, it's like looking into the past for like a certain amount of time or rather certain amount of steps when you generate the next the next uh window yeah if if anyone knows why they want to do this you can i guess kind of chime in so i guess the idea is you know you want to um 
not decode the entire response, but encode parts of a response at one time, right? So if you see part of the utterance or the whole utterance, you might um, uh, be able to create part of your response. And then when you see more, you might uh, continue to try to build out your response. That's that's what I'm getting out of this. But then I guess why wouldn't they just uh, attend to everything that was generated previously? Why why have like a window? Why just the last couple of words? Yeah. I don't know. I I think that isn't that clear to me. Um, they. Like you said, they, they said they're splitting the target sequence into non-overlapping contiguous segments, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't very clear why why they're doing this. But. Anyone else have input? I'm gonna try to read part of it. I haven't read it yet. Uh, maybe uh, I, I I guess so. Uh, uh, what what well, the the purpose is to like to decode the se uh, decode the sequence uh, uh, step by step. I mean, uh, for for example, if you if you just use a normal uh, decoding method such as beam search, uh, then it will uh, the, the the essential idea of the beam search is to search over all the possible generations and find the one that with the uh, with uh, with the highest probability, then in this case you will probably probably find some uh, very general response such as I don't know which has very high probability, right? Uh, but if you do this decoding uh, step by step, uh, uh, you are less likely to find the very general response, uh, even if its global uh, probability is quite high. Oh, okay. So I guess you kind of limit. You kind of, you're kind of limiting the beam in that sense. Yeah, you like to uh, restrict the search space. Uh, for example, if you if you already know what what's the first three words of, of your response, then the then the uh, then the search space will shrink a lot. Uh, uh, it will be impossible to find uh, a, a a general response like uh, I don't know, right? Right. But yeah, the reason why they are using uh, fixed length, uh, I think, is because they're using the sequence the sequence encoder, right? The encoder is uh, if you fix the entire utterance generated up into that point, you know, you'll lose more and more of the source, right? So the green part is the target. If you encode a longer and lo longer target, you'll have uh, less and less of the original source um, in, in the eventual encoded state at the end. So I think they're trying to fix the uh, uh, amount of steps um, that's in there in the uh, sequence in order to uh, make sure that they they don't lose the information about the target. Um, this doesn't look like a very good solution to me. I mean, I, I think you would need two separate LSTMs or, or two separate two separate sequences to to do this. But this is sort of like a to me some type of a hack uh, so that you can embed. Uh, using a single LSTM, both the first and uh, wait, but if uh, you're doing are realized. But if you're doing attention, wouldn't like wouldn't you attend to like every state? So then it doesn't lose information, right? Even let's say you have a ten, uh, like okay, let's say a five length five sequence from the. Like a length five target sequence here, you you will still be attending to everything, right? So, like, so you you if you do attention on every hidden state, you would still have, you would still know what is going on here. You wouldn't lose information. I mean, if no. you only have the hidden state, then you would lose information. But if you are doing attention, then you should not, right? Yeah, yeah, I understand. But, uh, but, uh, but when you do the decoding, you you need to aggregate. All the hidden states of your source to get uh, to to get a context vector based on the tension, right? So so if you uh, so this like to taking all the taking the average of all the hidden states, 
uh, of the encoder. So, so if the if the target sentence become longer and longer, then it will be more and more insignificant for oh. the goal of source, right? When you when you do the average. Mm. Yeah. So I guess it's like diluting the. Ah uh, yes yes. I, I, I think so. the contribution of the source, right? You're fixing it to a, a, a certain fixed amount of contribution, these three tokens, yeah. which those three tokens are varying over time. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, so then the, the other problem that they um, pose is uh, response diversity. So what they do to kind of solve this is they use stochastic beam search and they do like re-ranking in this segment by segment way. So I, I'm not sure if this is why that they decided to do this or if, if it was because of the limitation from, the, from here that they decided to do this segment by segment re-ranking. Yeah. So, so the normal beam search is like you choose the top, uh, let's say B or so B is like a beam with the width. So, uh, let's say you choose the top five candidates with the highest probability, and then you go again, the top five, the next step. So what they do is instead of doing this, they just choose any five or any B candidates. So that's it. They, that's why they call it a stochastic. Yeah. So then they, they do this thing called segment by segment re-ranking as well. Let me see if I have a, yeah. So I'm not so sure what this is doing. Like I wasn't, I didn't really understand what, what they were doing with this normalizing so they, they call it re-ranking but then they say uh, they normalize by using random access so yeah maybe we can discuss this okay yeah that's a good idea this is on uh, i think let's see which page is it it's six i think yeah the bottom oh, of six, six right yeah. on the first column Uh, oh, it's the bottom of four, four and five. Okay. So in the paragraph right before, they, they are saying that uh, there's a distinction between distributions that are sharp and ones that are smooth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you read that part of it, uh, they're, they're going for that. Yeah, so I think I have it in the slide here. Right. And then um, for the re-ranking, they choose the random prompts, right? But um, why exactly are they choosing it? I guess they, I don't know, I guess they want to, they, if, but the thing is if they, they want to increase diversity, but then by using random prompts, they're kind of like, I guess somewhat maximizing the unconditional probability of the generated sentences, right? I think they're trying to, to do something similar to your blandness uh, slides earlier, right? What I, what I understand is that when you randomly see uh, sample prompts, you want to uh, uh, make sure that the target that's generated isn't very isn't a very good fit for these other random prompts that are somewhat specific to the prompt that uh, that that came in, right? So you, you want to look at the specifically the X that came in and not something that's good for other X's. Oh, so I guess then they're 
they're using the one that is the worst instead of the best. Um, right. Maybe the like the first thing they are saying in at the top of page five, it says uh, in our stochastic beam search algorithm, we replace this deterministic toppy selection by a stochastic sampling operation in order to encourage variation. So, I guess this encourages variation. If if it if it refers to that change, though, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, that part that paragraph is just motivating the idea of using uh, a beam search rather than a single a single uh, individual beam, right? If you uh, read down a little bit, right? For each single token extension of an individual beam, we don't enumerate all possibilities, but inst instead sample a fixed number of candidates. Oh, this is for the beam search. Yeah, so so instead of like using the best, the top best, they use oh, like a random mm -hmm. selection. That's oh, I why see. they call it interesting. Yeah, so I think the random selection is, is just to make sure that uh, you know, whatever generated doesn't fit for any random prompt. It has to be sort of specific to this prompt. Yeah, so I think, well, that, that's what I understand. But uh, yeah, I haven't read it too. Do they say they're using the score as a, a, a minimum target or a maximum target? Yeah, they don't, they don't say. I guess if you're dividing it, then the, let's say, let's see the, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, so if you're dividing it, then I guess a lower summation would increase the overall score, right? So, yeah, so. I, I think uh, I think Prof. Stanley is correct. So, yeah, if you want to, if you want this equation to be larger, then you need the denominator to be larger and the this, uh, denominator to be smaller, yeah. right? So, so uh, which means that you need the y k to be best fit for x for the right x, uh, but you w also want the y k not a good fit for x prime. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it's probably that it's so it's like the higher score for the random prompts will be will bring down the the, the normalized score for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want the higher for the nominator and the lower for the denominator. So, yeah. So that's a good paper. I mean, it fits very well with the first uh, paper from Microsoft that you went through. But this is a Google paper, so it's a little different. They have a yeah. different way of doing the same type of work. It's all yeah. very similar objectives. So I think especially for those who are not, uh, of, of you on the call who are not specifically dialogue folks, you know, um, hopefully you can generalize from, from uh, what we've discussed today about this problem about making sure that your response is um, entrained. You know, you taking away from um, the, the source input, right? And encoding that information so that the response is coherent and, and follows from uh, the work that's previous. Um, in a lot of uh, discourse uh, understanding, uh, oftentimes we uh, think of um, a conversation that's being transacted. That's another word you might hear from once in a while. This is uh, uh, the idea that you know when you have a conversation, you are building, you're making a transaction on somebody else's part uh, that was contributed earlier. So somehow a conversation, if it's supposed to be good, needs to build on the context that comes before it. So when we think about conversation, it's not just utterance versus, uh, and another utterance and another utterance, but basically it's sort of like building a, a, a building a foundation for the conversation and then building a house or a building on top of it. That's the idea of transactivity, right? That you you take what's in the previous conversation and con continue to build on that. So you can see some of these models are, are trying to to computationalize that in, in some type of respect by making sure that the the response generated specific to the source input, right? 
But and these are still very much very primitive models because they're only looking at uh, you know pairwise information, right? Even uh, when Xu Chen uh, presented the first part on co-reference, um, and now here in dialogue, you can all think about the case that uh, sort of like a chain of co-references might be good all on their own, but together collectively they don't make sense. And that's the same with dialogue, right? You could say that one dialogue turn is like coherent with another one, but if you look at a string of utterances, they're all adjacently coherent with each other, but the overall the overall conversation doesn't make any sense. So there's still a lot of room to have some type of global coherence uh, that we seek uh, from human conversation that's not modeled in uh, dialogue systems right now. Okay, so um, I mean, there's surrogates or, or related things that you will see in IR system. So for example, when Google uh, generates a, a, SERP, a search engine response page, right, that's to list out 10 entries for you to click on, right? It's of course trying to do what they call point-wise relevance, which is to say all 10 of those listings on Google search results have to be relevant to your search, right? But it also wants to do some type of pairwise comparison, right? It wants all of those things to be sort of diverse from each other. So the previous uh, search result in position two should be uh, somehow different from the ones that are on position one. And same with uh, position three. Position three has to be different from position two. But then you can think about this uh, idea of list-wise coherence, right? That, that the entire list of search engine responses that are given to you sort of have to be diverse enough that you represent more, most of the different types of uh, query functions that people would do when you make a particular search, okay? So that type of global coherence is still not something that's very well modeled in any of these uh, models that we looked at today. Okay, we're always doing some type of linear approximation. When, when Shu Tian talked about the dialogue state tracking system, um, it is sort of like that, it's aggregating over time, you know, at each time step. You know, what more information that I receive from the user, I'm going to put that in, in my storage hold that represents the dialogue state. But somehow it doesn't have a, a many of them don't have an overall idea of what, what needs to be done. But they don't model the path specifically and say, okay, after getting this information, I should get that information. Okay, Samson, you want to wrap it up? I think you have just one last slide. Yes, yeah, so the last slide is the references. <laughs> That's all. Okay, so yeah. uh, we're over time, uh, but I think uh, it seems to have worked okay. Uh, I have to go figure out where the recording went. Uh, anyway, it goes to you. Like, so the person, the person who sent out the meeting invite or the one that's holding the meeting gets the, the recording. Yeah, it's supposed to appear in my drive folder for this user, but I checked it earlier. I couldn't find any. Anyways, don't worry about it. Uh, last Next week, sorry, is our last meeting. And uh, I thank you uh, for coming uh, online today. I think uh, Heng Chan is going to present with hopefully two other people. I think one of them may or may not be participating anymore. But uh, let's hope everything goes well. And so I wish you all a good Friday. Uh, since it is Good Friday, and uh, thanks for participating, even though it's the holidays. Okay, with that, um, you know, I think that's all. So uh, we'll end the session here. Let's thank Samson again for the presentation. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Ah.